Justification is by faith alone. It was while we were yet enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. It was while we were ungodly while we were sinners. There's no question about that. That's the cardinal doctrine. It's the first great principle. But justification is only one step and an initial step only in a process. And the process includes not only justification, but regeneration and sanctification and ultimate glorification. Justification and forgiveness of sins are not ends in and of themselves, but they are only steps on a way that leads to final perfection. Now that is the whole answer to the problem. We will persist in isolating these things. They are not isolated in the scriptures. Whom he hath called, them hath he also justified, and whom he hath justified, them hath he also glorified. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. There's the whole process. And the point is that if you're in it at all, you're in it all. Now then, we can't divorce justification and forgiveness, I say, from the remainder. And the remaining steps were put very clearly before us in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. Such, says the apostle, having given his terrible list of sins, such were some of you. But ye are washed. You've been washed. But he has sanctified. You've been set apart. God has moved you from that. He's put you into his own kingdom. He has separated you as a people for himself. But he has washed. But he has sanctified. But he has justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What's it mean? It means this. That God doesn't just justify a man and leave him there. No, no. If God justifies a man, God has brought that man into the process. If you can say that you're justified, I say about you that you've been washed, that you've been sanctified, you've been taken out, you've been removed, you've been put into a new realm and into a new kingdom. You're in this process of God that's leading to your ultimate entire perfection. So, you see, the verse that we're looking at this morning rarely is saying this. If there is no evidence in our lives of this process into which God puts the people whom he justifies, well then all I can say is that we've not been justified. We are just saying, Lord, Lord, but he'll say to us, I never knew you. Depart from ye, ye that work iniquity. For the argument is that when God justifies a man, he does bring him into this process and these things happen to him. So, the way to approach a verse like this, or the early part of the sixth chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, I will put in this form. These verses are put before us in order that we may test ourselves by them, in order that we may apply the test of their statements. We were so ready to say, Lord, Lord, yes, but uh, listen, says Paul, know this, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any part or portion in the kingdom of God. It's a terrible thing, you know. But there have been people in the church who have said, Lord, Lord, but we're guilty of these things. Read chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. And there you'll find there was a man, a member in the church at Corinth, who was guilty of such a terrible sin that it's not even mentioned, he says, amongst the Gentiles. Some of these indescribable foul sins. Here was a man saying, Lord, Lord, and yet guilty of that at the same time. No, no, says Paul. No, no, says the New Testament everywhere. This is not a matter of words. Any man can say, Lord, Lord. If he thinks he'll get him to heaven, he'll say so. Yes, but if he still goes on with his sin, there's no value in it. He is not a justified man. The man who's justified is a man to whom the process has been applied. He is in it. And his whole relationship to sin and evil is a new one. He's been washed. 
He's been sanctified. He's been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. But it's more than a test. And I end with this. Did you realize that these kind of verses are a very part of God's way of sanctifying us? You remember his last prayer? He said, Lord God, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He'd already said to certain people, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Had you realized that it is through these words that God sanctifies us? It's a part of his method of sanctification. These great warnings, these threatenings, these alarming statements, these are the things that God uses to sanctify us. He applies them to us by the Spirit, you see, in this way. Now I can test, we can all test ourselves at this moment whether we are Christians or not. How do you react to my text this morning? Does it concern you? Does it alarm you? Does it make you feel ashamed of yourself and your life? Do you say it's absolutely right and I'm ever in danger of relapsing into antinomianism? If so, I tell you you're in the kingdom. God has used this verse through the Holy Spirit in order to promote your sanctification. These words come to awaken the true believer. They don't touch the others. The others are just made to feel uncomfortable. They say, that's all wrong. I thought I was justified by faith only. And they put it in such a way as to make you see at once that what they really mean is this. I thought that the gospel said that it didn't matter if I went on sinning, that I was all right if I believed in Christ. They make the blood of Christ a cloak to cover their sins. They make merchandise of the cross. They're balancing, putting themselves right. But the man who is rarely called the man who's in the kingdom, he says, this is right. It must be right. God is holy. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And these very words are used and employed to further and to deepen and to expedite his sanctification. In other words, I can put it in those great words of the Apostle John in again his first epistle, third chapter, third verse. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Of course, a man may say glibly, yes, I want to go to heaven. I've got this hope in me. You haven't, says John. Here's the test. If you've really got this hope in you, if you're really looking to entering that holy city at the end and to spend your eternity in it, every man that really has this hope in him purifieth himself. Of course he does. He's bound to. Even as he is pure. But the man who's only got his, the hope on his lips and not in his heart, he doesn't purify himself. He goes on living the old life. And the truth about him is, of course, that he has no inheritance at all in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He doesn't belong to it. He says, Lord, Lord. But speech is cheap and easy. The question is, is the hope in our hearts? If it is, we recognize the truth. We say, yes, we do know this. That people who live like that, obviously, cannot have and have not any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. There is no contradiction between these statements and the doctrine of free grace and justification by faith only. They establish it. For the God who justifies goes on with the process. And unless we are giving evidence of being in the process and of being perfected by it, There is but one conclusion to draw. We have never been in the kingdom at all. We must go back to the very beginning. We must do the first works. We must repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ.